Hello, welcome to the second We Pause weekly session where we are trying to just take a step back for 30 minutes, de-stress, and learn something that helps with our mental health. Today we have a great guest, a PhD in neuroscience. She is a, a researcher, very interested in mental health domain. She's doing a lot of great things on the side in mental health, and, and we are always like having great conversations about so many things we have in common. When we were talking la last few weeks, uh, WePause came up, and she has always been a great thought partner on this project as well. So I asked her to join us uh, in this session and tell us a little bit more about emotion theories. And it's, I think it's super important for us to know these things, and I don't know it for one, uh, because then that would allow us to understand our emotions and manage them as, as good as we can. Uh, so without further ado, I pass it to Mariam for give us an intro, and then we start our meditation. So Mariam, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And thank you, Ali, for the nice intro and um, giving me this opportunity to uh, be the guest speaker here. Um, I am Mariam Bijanzadeh. I've, I'm also an immigrant from Iran. Um, I A little bit about myself and my career specifically, I uh, studied electrical engineering back in Iran, but immigrated to the U.S. about 13 years ago to study and um, I wanted to learn all about the brain and I was so fascinated about it. Um, after my PhD, I came to UCSF. I studied, uh, I studied affective behavior in epileptic patients and I studied how the brain circuit is uh, associated with like, let's say, smiling. Um, I, I, was, I am and I was very passionate about understanding um, like the underlying mechanism of emotion in brain and body. But at the end of my uh, fourth year as a postdoc, um, I had sort of a mental health crisis <laughs> and um, I, um, I wasn't able to see the future of my career and uh, also COVID hit. Uh, so it was very sort of gray uh, at that moment. So I decided to go to a biotech industry and I was um, I joined the biotech in industry working with cardiac. I mean, um, working with cardiac data as a data scientist. Uh, it was a very uh, interesting opportunity, but after one year, I realized that I want to follow my passion and I um, study human emotion still. Um, however, it took about two years to realize that I want to come back to academia and also finding the position and the environment um, to um, pursue this path and passion. Um, I'm very excited to um, um, actually connect the basic science about emotion in the mental health domain. Um, and also, I'm getting more interested in the psychology of it. Uh, so, yeah, uh, happy to uh, see you all here, and thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Mariam. About five-minute meditation uh, session here. Uh, I'm happy to guide you guys. Um, this is my first time actually guiding in English, which is fun, because I've been guiding meditation in Farsi in my podcast for a while, but... We'll see how that goes. We are we are going to share this experience together. Um, so we can actually begin by closing our eyes and bringing our focus uh, to our breath. Inhale deeply and fully exhale. Take a moment to feel this rise and fall of your chest and abdomen. See how it feels. Now, scan your body for any potential tension. Release it with each exhale, feeling more relaxed with every breath. One more deep breath. Now, I want you to shift your attention to your thoughts. These are things we always like run away from. 
notice them without any judgment. Just observe. And if your mind wanders, it's totally normal. Gently return your attention to your breath if that happens. Notice any sensation or feelings that may arise within you. Explore those emotions a little. You may feel sadness, happiness, fear. Just notice them. These observations can sometimes be hard, so offer yourself compassion as you experience them. Observe these emotions like Clouds passing in a blue sky. Now, pay attention to this fact that how this observation made you feel. What emotion has arise? Observe that emotion as another cloud in that blue sky. Continue to breathe deeply. Allow your emotions to change and evolve and just dance. In this last few seconds, I just want you to bring your attention to your emotions and how it's connected to your deep breath. Just let it go for a few seconds. And when you feel, feel ready, gently open your eyes. Look around if you want to. And I hope you had a good five minutes. With that said, I will pass it to... Maria. Great. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Awesome. So um, you can write uh, the emotions that you felt in the chat if you're uh, willing. Um, we start with this question and we will come back to this. How many emotions can you name and feel? For the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I will be talking about emotions and the main two theories uh, and just um, to mention that um, we, we are going to just scratch the surface of the literature. Um, so per American Psychology Association, uh, emotions are defined as complex reaction patterns involving experiential, behavioral, and physio physiological elements. 
uh, and they can be felt during um, personally significant events. Technically, emotions are taught to be transient um, as opposed to mood, and uh, they're evoked by a variety of stimuli. It could be internal or external, such as feedback on an exam, imagine the stimuli, memories or fantasies. Um, I want to talk about that transient part more because um, I would like you to assume uh, that you may feel, uh, you may um, like Im imagine that you're feeling, you're reading a book and then you're feeling interested in that and someone just comes in and says something to you and you may feel totally uh, different emotion. So it could be very transient in a, in a um, temporal resolution of seconds. However, the moods are like a longer sort of, uh, they have longer um, temporal structure. Uh, emotions are technically um, a felt or experienced within three systems in our um, existence, the brain or the, which in, in, I mean, the neural, which includes central and peripheral, uh, the physiology, which could include um, heart rate, um, you know, um, uh, skin conductance or sweat glands and so on and so forth and specific hormones and um, also the behavioral component of it, which uh, one of the main important ones are facial expressions that you can see here. So on the top right, you are seeing um, a fMRI image of a subject uh, that they were, I think, watching um, negatively weighed uh, stimuli, visual stimuli. And you can see like this uh, sort of activated pattern in their brain, um, although the emotion circuit is uh, way more complicated. But in this specific stimuli, these seeds uh, uh, came out. And at the bottom, you can see the facial expressions of the fear stimuli. Uh, so talking about the physiology, um, physiology is, um, is um, controversial in some sense. However, uh, some of the uh, very basic emotions, uh, they're very well studied, they're, they're in physiological patterns. For example, the, when we are so, uh, when we're feeling um, fear, we would see it in our heart rate, in our skin conductance, and so on and so forth. Um, going back to the brain, uh, as I said, it's just scratching the surface. Um, Popes and later on other um, actually um, extracted features, um, brain regions that are associated with emotion processing. The take home message here is that there are many brain regions that are involved in emotion processing. On the left, you can see uh, some of them are color coded. Uh, there's like this huge architecture. Sorry, my mouse is not moving in there. Yeah. Um, so you can see this huge architecture here, which is called singlet cortex. It's involving different emotion processing. And there's like amygdala, which is also very important in a lot of uh, negative um, balance stimuli and also positive. Uh, so there are like a lot of, they have a lot of roles and distinct and also shared roles in emotion uh, and coding in the brain. And on the right, uh, later on, based on the function of these uh, brain circuits, um, people are, uh, you know, it, working on this parts as like some of this uh, some part of this circuit um, is um, responsible for emotion generation um, but some part is responsible for emotional regulation for example the frontal part of the brain like um, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex or orbital frontal cortex that are they're like just above our forehead um, um, are kind of responsible for emotion regulation and they are all connected to each other so that's why it's called brain circuit um, this is uh, showing an example of physiological activity um, for about 50 seconds of data. So on top, you're seeing ECG activity, electrocardiograms. Um, it's it's a very um, sort of fast activity um, compared to the other physiological responses. Uh, the second row is showing our respiration. Uh, the third row is uh, the skin conductance or electrodermal activity. It's technically uh, measuring the sweat glands of um, of a skin and a um, you know, sensor could be attached to any part of the body, but it's usually att attached to the uh, fingers. And at the bottom, you can see the heart rate. So there is a huge body of literature studying this physiological activity in association with emotions. Um, for example, on the right, on the top right, you are seeing that uh, skin conductance uh, level uh, in two different conditions, uh, like the relaxed state, which is shown in green, and the blue state, which is, which is uh, showing a nervous state. And at the bottom, you can see different states of breathing rate during these different, you know, um, for example, during meditation, during normal breathing and anger. 
Um, and there is um, also a huge body of literature working and a lot of studies working on understanding the interplay between physiology and the brain and which comes first and a lot of million dollar questions that there is still uh, to be answered. Uh, the main uh, two base, uh, the main two emotion theories are uh, basic emotion theory and dimensional emotion theory. Uh, the basic emotion theory was part of, oh, sorry, it shouldn't show my, it's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I hope it's not distracting you. Uh, it definitely distracted me. Uh, so Charles uh, Darwin, um, the basic emotion theory is part of the centerpiece idea of evolution uh, theory of Darwin. So he was implying that emotions and their expression are uh, biological and adaptive. And there is there are some emotions that are universal across human species. Paul Ekman later on, um, it's not that later, but it's like centuries later, actually it is later, but uh, he defined six basic emotions, uh, like uh, such as um, happiness, sadness, fear, surprise, anger, and disgust. And the main component that Paul Ekman was saying, these are, um, you know, different distinct emotions um, is a, was based on facial expression. So on the right, this is like, I mean, all, when you search Ekman faces, this, this is going to come up. So you can see there are like different features on the face that you can say these are different emotions. But later on, he added other em emotions, as you can see in this, uh, in the last bullet points. But main thing about basic emotion theory is that each emotion, they have distinct neurophysiological and behavioral patterns, and they may be predictable. However, if we go to the constructionist or dimensional theory, which was presented by William James and Carl Lang in late 19th century, um, they are saying that emotions are, um, we experience two opposite emotions, like pleasure versus displeasure and excitement versus calmness. And uh, they're mixed together to, for to form all other emotions. So technically they, they were defining two main axes and they were trying to put all the um, all other emotional categories on these two axes. And later on, recently they added more um, axes such as avoidance versus approach and so on and so forth. In this uh, theory, physiological changes are highly flexible and they integrate into the culture and language, and they may lack predictability. And for the past, I think, 150 years, uh, people are fighting with, um, you know, favoring one of these two theories, al although there are evidences supporting both theories. Um, uh, but one main thing is that, and I'm also not a fan of any of them, but uh, I, I want to say that um, for example, people are from dimensional theory, they think that the whole brain doesn't distinguish between specific categories of emotion. Uh, let's say sadness versus bored. Uh, but it's it cares about like the intensity of the emotion or the positiveness of the emotion. So, um, yeah, and uh, at the, on the left, you can see like, um, I think in this paper, they measured arousal and you can see like, sorry, maybe it's small, but like the fearful stimuli and the unused stimuli, they evoked certain level of arousal in the brain, although they have like totally positive balance. Um, so you may have encountered emotion wheels uh, when uh, visiting a therapist or when you have a medical appointments. And recently uh, after COVID, we, we would see this more. There are lots of other emotion wheels. This is not the only one and you can find them on internet. Um, the main thing about them is that they have both positive and negative emotions and they have different granularity, um, but it's good to have them as a, as, as a sort of reference to detect our emotions. But I, I wanna say that recognition of emotions could be also culture and language specific. So coming from another culture, I myself was still not able to call and um, detect a lot of emotions, um, but I, I can feel it, for example, in the body, something is happening in my body. So, and this is just another two wheels that it shows how crazy it can get, <laughs> but we don't want to get into that part and get started, but uh, these are references for yourself. So you can see like, these are like the central negative ones, central positive ones, and there's a lot of them. So for example, I myself didn't know that beautiful could be an emotion. I could assign it to something that something is beautiful, but what is evoking in me? What is that one? Uh, so why is all this important? Uh, so what, technically? 
At the end of the day, we would like to be to be able to observe our emotions in momentarily fashion. So, for example, uh, assume that you're sitting in a party and all of a sudden you realize that your energy level is dropped or you talk to someone and feel like you're so energized. But and you can get uh, but can can we get more specific about this energized versus down? Uh, what does this positive and negative state exactly point uh, to? Did we feel hopeful or proud after we talked to that person? Or did we feel alone or bored or jealous in that party? Uh, can we name these specific different emotions? Um, and if we can name them, and what's the point of naming them? If we can name them, they may help us, exper- um, you know, building a distance between ourselves and the you know, overwhelmed emotion. Um, and this observation is going to, would be like maybe the first step for a lot of, you know, um, uh, self-exploration about ourselves. Um, also, another metric uh, that uh, is interesting, and, and as we just, you know, uh, scratch the surface of it, is to pay at, to pay attention um, about our uh, to pay attention to the physiology. What's happening in my heart rate? For example, I'm giving this pub this this a talk, so I'm stressed. My heart rate was like over hundred, like before the meditation, and after that, I could see that it came down. So um, this is very interesting. If we can't name them, uh, or we don't have the proper semantics to it, but we can observe the changes in our body. Do I have a tense feeling in my stomach? What's happening to my hands? What happening? What's happening in my uh, legs? So on and so forth. Um, so um, and for wrapping up, um, the other thing is to u- the usage of technology, of course. And the nice thing that I uh, realized recently, and one of my friends actually uh, showed this to me, is that um, iOS is using these emotion theories in their health app uh, to um, have these questionnaires. And you can use these questionnaires across the day if you have an Apple um, or iOS. Monitor your emotions. So the nice thing is that on the top left, you can see that... um, uh, you know, it, there's a scroll uh, bar that you can say, okay, I'm feeling neutral or very pleasant or uh, very unpleasant. And then, so this is based on that dimensional te- theory that we talked about. And on the right, you can see, okay, if I am very, I'm feeling very pleasant, what exactly I'm feeling? Can I can I name it here? And the nice thing about Apple, of course, and for those who are very interested in the data data science part of it or like visualization of their own data, they also uh, provide stats at the end of the week, I believe. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find it uh, for Android, and I'm also an Android user. Uh, there are a lot of uh, mood apps for Android as well, but not like similar to this. And of course, you can rate your emotions or set reminders on your Apple Watch. Uh, so that was all I had, and I will just reiterate the question now. How many emotions can you name and feel? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariam. Uh this was this was awesome. Uh, we'll leave this five minutes for any question because I know it was a very informative presentation, uh, and I wonder if there are any questions, any reactions. I can ask. Um, I'd love to know a little bit more about if you, if you have any uh, techniques or anything that can help with either uh, boosting a particular emotion or suppressing one. Once I know what I'm feeling, I'd rather do something about it. Either kill it or keep it. Um, I I don't uh, assume myself as the person to answer to this question. I don't have it, uh, you know, in a sense of like my background, but experiential, uh, based on my experience, um, I believe there are some breathing technique that Ali uh, is aiming to address in this uh, project and uh, application um, that um, would help to, for example, calm ourselves, or even like some exercises. Maybe that if you are like feeling like low energy and you're you wanna like stay at, you know alert, there are some sort of exercises that you may be able to do. But like, can I put down my anger? Of course, <laughs> but you know I'm not in in that position to comment on it. So uh, yeah, there. Are, but I think the first step, as someone who is also experiencing. Um, and going through like practices is to realize our emotion to like call them and like this calling 
make you know like helps separating us from the emotion um from that overwhelming feeling of it um that's that's the main thing that i would suggest uh yeah and if you want to answer the question i'm also not on that level to answer this uh, scientifically uh, but to mariam's point this is uh also uh, in in my experience with meditation and a breath work activities that's been a way for me to manage and kind of like play with the physiology of it like uh, the the graph that you showed mariam by the way about like the changes in your breath uh, depending on uh, like those activities meditation versus angry moment and things like that i think that's that's really telling like how much uh of this this physiological relationship by by these emotions are very important and how we can actually manage them through activities. And I loved seeing meditation on top, uh, by the way, like the the most, the coolest uh, breath pattern that we can see here. Uh, so I think that that's telling, but that's actually, that's a very interesting topic that we can also like bring someone uh, to specifically talk about how to manage between one point to another more uh, accurately and effectively. I also saw Amir's hand up. No, no, no. I think uh, you answered because uh, what Sina asked was kind of my question. It's slightly different, but I had my own. Then I came up with my own answer, uh, which is you folks cover it too. It's mostly about, I don't think we should boost or kill or suppress our emotions. That's how it actually becomes worse. By worse, I mean the emotions uh, start conflicting with each other. It's more about observing it. Like if you get into an accident and you become angry, I think observing that, oh, now I'm angry, I shouted or whatever that happened. I'm just giving a hypothetical example, right? Next time, it, it may become something that happened to me. Maybe I was in an accident in childhood. It's, maybe it's fear now. The root cause is actually fear, not anger. Or maybe, I don't know, something else. So basically, I think it's a matter of observation. But again, how to observe it better is my own question too. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I think again, talking from the meditation perspective, and f- at least from the school of thought that I learned meditation, uh, that's one of the greatest tool to build this muscle to start observing more. Like it's, I, I don't know if it's guaranteed, but for me and c- cases that I've seen, it it really helps becoming that observer in situations, even in the worst cases. Like you said, I mean, like. I have had like weird, bad reactions to situation, but at least I was able to observe it. So next time I, I'm just having more awareness about it. Um, and we are at time. Uh, we also mentioned in our email for this week that we are happy to stay longer to hang out because that, that, that was one of the things that you all asked for it. A few people reached out and asked. So if you want to stay on this call to hang out more, please stay and it's going to be off the record. But if you have something else to do, uh, please uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you so much for joining this call. We're just going to be talking. And maybe since a lot of people may not know each other, we may, we may uh, just chit chat and introduce ourselves as we are seeing each other on the call. Those who are leaving us have a wonderful day. Mm-hmm.